Good morning. We are at John chapter 16 down in about verse 12 where we'll plan to begin. And uh, let me pray and then I have a couple of catch-up topics to uh, make sure that I cover for you and then we'll get into the into verse 12. Father, we ask your blessing on our study of your word this morning. We pray that you would, by your spirit, teach us and illumine our minds that we might understand your word and that our, our faith would increase, that you would mature us and, and teach us how to discern good from evil and to be able to be wise that we might honor you and we continue to pray also father for the whole world situation today and the people that are suffering in ukraine and and uh, we ask your uh, protection upon them and upon and particularly upon those that know you there and uh, we pray that you would so work as to soon bring an end to that conflict, but also to, or rather, should call it evil rather than just a conflict, but um, that you would use it to your glory and that, and that many who are still dead in their sins might be caused to uh, pause and consider the, the state of their soul before you and turn to Christ, and we pray this all in Christ's name. Amen. I saw on the news uh, a uh, picture of some Orthodox uh, Christians, and that term Christian there, I, I want to comment on that in a moment here too, but, um, oh, let's see, I need to bring up the scripture here on the screen. There we go. Um, anyway, in that picture, these people were carrying a full-size statue of Jesus on the cross out of their church building because they and they were going to put it somewhere underground where it couldn't be damaged and so forth and and um, they were they it said that the last time that that statue had to be removed from that church building was back in World War II when the Nazis were attacking. And anyway, it's just a, it was a really, that picture was a good image of what the, uh, illustration of what the Bible uh, has to say about dead, dumb, lifeless idols, right? I mean, here, here that so-called image statue of Jesus can't not only can't protect itself, but it has to be carried out and protected by the people that are. And I, I know that there will be, you know, they, the Orthodox Christianity, Roman Catholicism, and so forth argues that veneration of objects like that is not true worship. They make a little, you know, hair splitting distinction supposedly between. Uh, worship and veneration, I think, is how it goes. So, uh, but at any rate, bottom line is, it's idolatry, and and that's just a, an illustration of it. Now, when I said um, Christians, uh, mentioned the term Christians there, that relates to another point that I wanted to make, and that is that um, a few weeks back, we listened to a very good video. A lecture by Dr. Robert Godfrey, and I might be repeating myself here. Uh, I, I may have mentioned this at uh, one of our Sunday meetings, and but I just wanted to make sure that I get it out there to everybody. Um, and uh, it was a great lecture on the Crusades, <clears throat> and but and you know that lecture was part of a long series on church history that he did. So he may have clarified his terms in an earlier earlier video. But it's, that was an example of how when we start talking about how the church or how Christians went on these crusades and conquered, tried to conquer, sometimes they did, sometimes they didn't conquer Jerusalem. 
And uh, I know on one occasion, they, um, when they did conquer Jerusalem from uh, the Muslims, they killed a whole bunch of people in that um, in the city in, in Jerusalem. And so as uh, Dr. Godfrey was giving his lecture there, he was saying, and then the Christians uh, did this and the Christians did that and, and the church and so on. Well, <clears throat> it's very important for us to define our terms. When we talk about the church or when we talk about Christians, who are, who are we talking about? For instance, when we talk about the church and the Crusades, our, mo most often what people are talking about there is Rome, Roman Catholicism. Well, that's not Christ's church, all right? It's, it's a counterfeit. It's, uh, it, and, I mean, could there be genuine Christians within the Roman Catholic Church? Well, yes. I mean, Martin Luther was saved when he was a, a monk, and, but he didn't stay there. And, and uh, so, but, but you, see, you see the point here. Um, you start talking about, well, you know, Christians did this and so forth. Well, now hold on a minute here. Who is a Christian? And, and, uh, and you know, or, and, who, and what, what is the church? So we need to be really careful about that. The church is the elect of God, uh, and uh, you know we can talk about the the church uh, in this present world having tribulation and so forth, or we can talk about the church triumphant in heaven. We can talk about the invisible church, which is the uh, all genuine Christians in whether they be. Uh, past, present, or future, you know, people that have lived, people that are with the Lord now. Uh, but the, the church in the Bible is the body of Christ. It is, the, it is the body of those people who are in Christ, who are regenerate, who are born again. And there are, uh, and, and a Christian is such a person, all right? Um, and so, in that sense, it is erroneous to talk about uh, Rome, the Roman Catholic Church. It's not the church. Um, and, and so, we need to be very careful uh, in, in, our, in our terminology, you see. Well, I could talk a lot more about that, but I think you, I think you get the picture. The church is the remnant, God's remnant, and it's not some massive self-glorifying counterfeit like we see um, in Rome. Let's see, um, oh, also then, this morning I published on the Unholy Charade blog, right, unholycharade.com, uh, and a post there that has a link in it to a really good, it's only 12 minutes long, but a really good uh, uh, little video presentation by a man named Dr. Les Carter. And he has a whole channel there on YouTube. He focuses on narcissism, all right? Narcissism. That's a person that is totally consumed by themselves. And anyway, in this video, he's talking about... Um, he, he says there's um, over-narcissists, and you've probably known some like that. You know, their narcissism, their self-consumption of self, 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 and all their tactics to hurt other people and exalt themselves is right out there. You can see it, right? It's right out there. But then there's something called covert narcissists, and these are the kind that we're going, we deal with in the church because obviously they... They claim to be Christians. They put on this, this aura, this front, this disguise. And uh, anyway, he talks about that. And he talks about their characteristics. He, and, and it's just a real help for us to, to be wise in regard to this. You know, think of what Jesus told us about um, the Pharisees. On the outside, oh, you guys are all whitewashed 
you know, you look like beautiful sepulchers and, and, and whatever, but inside you're full of dead men's bones, you see. So we need to be very wise in regard to those. So anyway, Unholy Charade, the blog there this morning it has that link and is definitely worth uh, watching. And most, I don't know that he is a, he is a Christian necessarily, but his, his videos channel there on YouTube, Dr. Les Carter, uh, has I found it to be very, very, um, very, very helpful. So, all right, here we go then. Um, let's start at verse 12. Remember, we had just, we spent some time looking at this uh, not real easy uh, to figure out section, verses 8, 9, and 10. When he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteous judgment, talking about the Spirit, concerning sin because they do not believe in me, Concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father and you will see me no longer. Concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world is judge. And, and we looked at that and, and concluded that really that's, a, that's not so much a description of the Spirit working in the hearts of people to bring them to faith in Christ. I mean, he certainly does that. But that primarily it, it is that the Spirit is at work through things like the preaching of the gospel, the preaching of the word, and just the presence of, of the body of Christ, the church in this present world, that really what, what that is describing in those verses is God's pronouncement of guilt toward this world. Why? Because they refused to believe in Christ. The world rejected and, and killed him. And, and God, by His Spirit, is pronouncing the world guilty. So, all right then, well, we spent some time on that, but let's pick up then at verse 12. And there's 33 verses in this chapter. Um, these sections, these verses, these aren't real easy ones to, to sort out either, but we can certainly get at least the, the, main, uh, the main principles. So... Um, here we go, verse 12. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the Spirit of truth comes, He will guide you into all the truth. For He will not speak on His own authority, but whatever He hears, He will speak, and He will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify Me, for He will take what is Mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. Therefore, I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. Okay, so here Jesus is talking about another aspect of the uh, work of the Holy Spirit once the Spirit comes at, at, at Pentecost. Um, and, and the emphasis here in these verses is Further instruction, further revelation. It's interesting that Jesus says here in verse 12, um, I still have many things to say to you. All right? What are the many things that he still had to say? Well, pick up your Bible and look at the New Testament. And, and, and that's, that's what he was talking about. But as yet, the Spirit had not come. Um, in that, you know, the day of Pentecost hadn't happened. In that sense, the disciples were still in that, what would you call it, pre-New Testament era, right? Uh, Christ is about to go to the cross. And, uh, and so, you know, theologians, people argue about you know, when did the church begin? And, for example, uh, dispensational theologians will say that the church did not exist in the Old Testament. Only the Jews, only Israel as the people of God. Uh, and that it didn't begin until um, the day of Pentecost when the Spirit came. Um, I remember when I first went to Bible college, first taking some of my classes way, way back when in Bible college and and right off the bat in kind of an orientation time uh, 
there, I don't remember what document it was, but there was real emphasis that that Bible college, it was dispensational school, and they put a real emphasis right off the bat on the church did not begin until the day of Pentecost. Well, if you read um, uh, reform theologians, for example, you will find them referring to the church in the Old Testament, in the Old Testament era. But anyway, we, we won't get into that, but um, that's just a little side note. Maybe you can do some, some reading uh, on that sometime. I would say the answer to that is in uh, Hebrews chapter 11 and Romans chapter 4, where talks about Abraham being justified by faith and so on. Um, but anyway, Jesus says, I have many things to say to you. You can't bear them now. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. He'll not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will, de he will declare to you the things, it's interesting there, isn't it, that are to come, the things that are to come, he will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. So here we see, and this is important stuff here, of course everything in the Bible is important, but um, the, we see characteristics here of the ministry of the Holy Spirit now in the church age. First of all, he's called the spirit of truth. Okay, so... He speaks the truth. You want to know the truth? Then you listen to the Spirit. Well, how do you listen to the Spirit? We see here now, he guides them into all truth. Now, of course, kind of a, a, a du duality here in the application, I think. Here Christ is talking to his disciples, the apostles, and we know that, in part at least, initially, um, what Jesus is talking about here is what we call um, the inspiration of Scripture because when the Spirit came, one of the things that he did is he guided and directed the apostles so that they, without error, um, um, gave us the New Testament, right? Gave us the the, the scriptures. He guided them into, into all, the, all the truth. What is the truth? The truth is God's word, right? He doesn't speak on his own authority. Whatever he hears, he will speak. You see kind of a divine progression here. God the Father, um, you know, in verse 15, all that the Father has is mine, okay? So the Father um, gives his word, say, to the Son, and then, therefore I said that he will take what is mine, the Spirit then will take what is mine, Jesus says, and declare it to you. So it goes from the Father to the Son and to the Spirit, and there's never, ever, ever any conflict there. All are, all are in agreement. Now I think another thing that we can not only does this then concern the um, inspiration of the apostles so that they wrote and spoke and delivered without error what what uh, without error God's word but it also applies to every Christian as well because we know you can read up say on Romans 8 on this one that the Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth for us as well. He, he guides us into all the truth. But there's a difference, isn't there? There's a difference between us and the apostles in, in this sense. When the Holy Spirit was, for example, um, guiding the apostle Paul into all truth, right? Into the many things that Christ had to say to him and then us, um, he was doing so in a way that was revelation. He was, he was revealing his word. We, he says, I, I, uh, 
I have many things to say to you. You can't bear them now. In other words, he hadn't said them yet. But through the apostles, and then as they, they wrote Christ's words down, and we have it here in, in our Bibles, um, Christ did say, did say those things, all right? But there's emphasis there on the word did. It's done. It's complete. He's, he has spoken. He has spoken to us. Um, and and uh, so, so there's a difference here between what the Spirit's ministry was in the apostles as far as when they were, um, he was revealing this new truth to them and to us. The Spirit, the Holy Spirit does not reveal new truth to us, all right? He doesn't do that. The Bible is complete. It's, it, it's finished. The, Christ here said, I still have many things to say to you. Well, he said them. Now, the Holy Spirit is at work in us in a sense, showing us new things, but they aren't new. It's like, uh, is it in 1 John, where John says something like, and I'm just paraphrasing here, but he, he, he's saying, you know, a, a new commandment I give to you, which isn't really a new commandment. But, but things in Scripture are, are new to us, and there's the key, things in Scripture, in the Bible, are new to us, as the Holy Spirit enables us to see what's there and to understand it. And you, you know what I'm talking about, that you, uh, as if you've been a Christian for a period of time, then you, you know that there's things that you now understand in Scripture, that kind of the lights came on, that you didn't understand before. But that's not the same thing as... as um, the Spirit giving new re revelation, okay? And so here we see another characteristic of the Spirit's ministry here in verse 13. He will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And today then, you know, as you're reading your Bible, uh, well, let's put it this way. There's a lot of people, right? A lot of them. And there's been a lot of them down through church history, and there's plenty of them today. You can see them on TV. You can read their books, but you don't want to read their books because it's a waste, worse than a waste of time. But there are plenty of people who claim that they're speaking or ministering by the Spirit, right? By the, by the Spirit uh, of, of God. But you see that even the Spirit himself doesn't just come up with stuff. He speaks what he hears and, and nothing else. Now, how do you apply that principle today? Well, he has spoken in, uh, in, in Christ. He's spoken, and, and we have what he said in, in the Bible. So, Whenever you have somebody that really, in the end, they're speaking on their own authority. God has shown me. And by the way, we should all be careful about talking that way. You know, God, God spoke to me. God showed me. Well, all right, God does speak to us. And he does show us. But how does he do that? He does it in the Word, in Scripture. And then the Spirit takes that, and maybe can even, we can see specific applications of that. But when you have, we shouldn't be characterized by being people who carelessly throw around, because really when you say, when anybody says, God, um, God said to me, and, uh, and then people start pronouncing Really, what they're saying is, thus saith the Lord. I mean, they're acting as a prophet, right? And uh, God doesn't look lightly on, on, that, on that, kind, that kind of a thing. Now, if it's somebody who says, uh, God showed me, 
where God spoke to me and, and what they, then they explained. I was reading this passage of scripture and man, the lights went on and I saw what that meant and I understood how I was to apply that. Well, that's a proper use then of the scripture and of the, and of the spirit. People really lose it in this regard. I mean, they can get caught up in this stuff so easily. I remember years and years ago preaching a sermon on, on this kind of a subject. And I remember telling the people, because I'd been, I'd been hearing people in the church, in our church at that time, uh, really carelessly throwing around this business. Uh, so, you know, some of them had come from a Pentecostal background or whatever, but, uh, but and, I, and I, I said, you know, we, we've got to stop that. And, and I mean, a, a couple of them never came back to the church again. They accused me of quenching the spirit, you know, all kinds of that, of that stuff and, and so on. Well, at any rate, the spirit, the spirit himself, the Holy Spirit himself does not come up with, well, okay, you know, this has been revealed to me. Well, if he does say that, <laughs> that this was revealed to him, it's because the Father revealed that to him, not because, you know, look at this. He will not speak on his own authority. You can know when somebody is speaking on their own authority and then tacking on God's name, you know full well that that, that is not of the Spirit. It, it is not it is not of God, all right? So the Spirit himself doesn't, doesn't do that. It's also interesting here, verse 13, and I don't know uh, really necessarily. It's something else to look into. I won't do it now, but he will declare to you the things that are to come. Now, that could be um, simply relating back to I, the many things that Christ had to say, but you can also see that... Um, it has a, what we would call an eschatological aspect to it. You know, eschatology. In Greek, the, the little adjective for last is eschatos. So, eschatos. So, when you say eschatology in theology, it means the doctrine or the subject of last things. A lot of people will say prophecy, end times, that, that kind of thing. But, but really, um, it, it encompasses the whole New Testament era and he will he's going to show us and again what he's talking about then there is is the new testament that that we have if you want to know if you want to know what the spirit says about the things that are to come well faithfully look at at your bible here's another aspect of the spirit's ministry verse 14 he will glorify me for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. So then the Holy Spirit, you know, of the, of the three persons in the Trinity, the Holy Spirit is like the behind the scenes person, right? Um, the Holy Spirit does not glorify himself. He's worthy of glory. He's worthy of worship. He's God. But but he functions to glorify, magnify Christ. And the way that he does that is he faithfully delivers uh, and declares the things of Christ, what, what Christ says. So here's another thing. When, when you run into people who are, they're, you know, they're all the time talking about the Holy Spirit and the Spirit led me to do this. The Spirit, sa the Spirit says this. The Spirit says that. Well, um, whenever there's an aspect of this alleged Spirit being the primary thing, right? The primary thing. You know right there something is haywire. Something is amiss. For example, you know, um, it's not just in Pentecostalism or charismatic theology, but nevertheless, you see it there all the time. Is it's in those circles, it's the Spirit, 
the Spirit, the gifts of the Spirit. And they, they make that the big thing. Oh, look at this person over here. They're, the big thing here is that we speak in tongues or, or have healing services, and that's the emphasis there, right? The Holy Spirit doesn't operate that way in His gifting or in anything else. What the Holy Spirit does, He will glorify Christ. He always, where the Holy Spirit is at work, He always points us to Christ. Always. And where you don't hear uh, Christ exalted, but you hear the Spirit exalted and at the expense of glorification of Christ, well, you, you, you've got a problem. So, so beware of that. You know, we have to be discerning. Um, 1 John, right? Here we go. 1 John 4. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they're from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. Many. And let's face it, we're often careless in this regard. Don't believe every spirit. Isn't it true that in the evangelical churches and so on, really, bottom line is, this verse is discounted, set aside, um, and really, we're, we are taught to believe every spirit, that, it, that it's, uh, it's wrong, it's judgmental, it's unloving to, uh, to judge, <laughs> to test and say, no, wait a minute here, wait a minute. Now, this guy might be speaking by the Spirit of God, or he might not. And how are you going to test? Well, you compare what they're saying to Scripture, and you examine the fruit of their, of their life. And, and uh, so this is a problem, by the way. <clears throat> you cannot examine the fruit of the tree if you don't know the tree, right? You know, you know you, you, people swallow hook, line, and sinker the, uh, these TV evangelists or whoever it might be. It can even be a, a pastor in a local church and definitely in a, in a big mega type church. Um, the people don't know that person, not really. So they're not able to examine the fruit of that person. Um, and we're supposed to, you will know the tree by its fruit. Well, so you don't know that. All you know is the image that's put up there for you. But we are called to test the Spirit. And if, and if you're in a situation, and I would say, let's, let's use a, a big church, a mega church for an example. I know there can be wicked people in small churches too, but let's take a let's take a a, a big one. Say you got it, you know, big to us is a thousand people, right? But that small potatoes to a lot of these places. Well, anyway, how are you going to test that person that you you don't know? Sunday after Sunday, they're up there preaching away, teaching away, and writing books and all these things. But how do you know? That the, the fruits of that person you don't. And yet people are swallowing it all, you know. Don't believe every spirit. Test the spirit to see whether they're from God. And one of the ways that you can test the spirit, then it's, it's always by the word, but what do we see in the word? Well, right here, we, we, just, we just saw a really good, a really good test. The Spirit will glorify Christ. And in that sense, you see the, okay, Christ. In any sermon, any teaching, any ministry, any church, even in an individual person's life who claims to be a Christian, Christ should be the one that's being glorified, not the person themselves. That's why we are, we are so foolish, stupid, and really unbelieving and disobedient 
in the evangelical churches today because think, you know, we create and exalt celebrities among us, right? I mean, that, that just happens all the time. And where does all the wickedness so often, you know, the, the so-called scandals and so forth come from? Well, it comes from these, the lives of these celebrities. Turns out it was, uh, they were a hypocrite. There should not be any celebrities in the church except Christ. You, right? Isn't that correct? There should not be a single celebrity. You know, a celebrity is what? It's a person that we celebrate, you know, and we're going to... Basically, it's, it's a worship uh, and glorification of a, of a person. We're kind of going kind of slow here this morning, but that's okay. Um, but check this out here uh, in 1 Corinthians 2. This always amazes me, this passage, because it was never emphasized in the seminary that I went to. I mean, this is, 1 Corinthians 2, is largely the central passage on a truly biblical philosophy and, and, and uh, method of Christian ministry, right, in the church. And look at what Paul says. And I, when I came to you, brothers, did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with, see it? Look at this. Lofty speech or, and really he means here, human wisdom, lofty wisdom, things that, I didn't come to you as a celebrity, you know, um, decorating my, my speech and my words as if I had a silver tongue and, and, uh, and oh, so that people are like, oh man, uh, look at, if people go away from church on Sunday, for example, and they're saying to one another, man, that guy can preach. Wow, that guy can preach. Oh, wow, that guy, boy, he really knows God. Something is terribly wrong, right? Terribly wrong. Maybe a person is really gifted in, in preaching. Paul was, but, but he said, I, I, he purposely didn't come to them in that kind of a demeanor. Verse 2, for I decided to know nothing among you except what? Jesus Christ and him crucified. Paul, preaching and speaking by the Spirit, exalted Christ and the cross, the gospel. That's what he pointed to people to. I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling my speech and message were not in plausible words of wisdom. And he's not talking there about, well, so I, I made sure I, I spoke illogical stuff to you. What he's saying here is that he didn't jazz up his um, vocabulary. You know, what, you know have you, you've heard people like that uh, talk and people... Um, and I, I mean, I could name names here, right? You can too. You can probably think of some that uh, people are, are, you know, just thousands and thousands and thousands of people following them and the millions of dollars coming in and, and people get all mad at you if you criticize some, somebody, li somebody like that. But, but again, obviously, something is horribly wrong if that kind of celebrity status is being, um, is being uh, produced. Rather, Paul says, I came in demonstration of the spirit of power. What is true spiritual power? What is the power of this power? And, and what is a demonstration of the spirit? It's the gospel. So that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. So check this out. This means that if you have a preacher, for example, who's preaching, uh, you know, he claims to be preaching God's word, but in fact he's promoting himself and the people are all like uh, building him up as a celebrity, preaching with lofty speech and, and, and wisdom and so on, um, and thereby is going to be neglecting Christ and the gospel, that person is not preaching and ministering in the power of God. And guess what? Uh, 
people are not going to get saved under a ministry like that. The whole thing becomes, becomes then a, a farce, okay? So we've got to be really wise in, re, in regard to these things. And it all comes back to what Jesus is saying here, that the Spirit will glorify Christ. He will take what is Christ and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. Therefore, I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. That's, that is what he, that's what he does, okay? Um, let's see here. I was going to read from Ryle, but I, I think I'll, I'll skip that part. We'll come back to him, but... Let's move on here then. Um, oh, there is a comment here by R.C. Sproul that I wanted us to look at, page 302 here. And it's under the source of real power. And I, I run into this as my memory gets worse week after week. So again, I, was, I apologize if I'm repeating myself here. I don't have it marked that I read this. Maybe I did, but at any rate, it's good stuff anyway, and good stuff is worth repeating. Sproul has a little section. This is his book, remember? Little, it's just a little commentary on the Gospel of John. So that's a good tool to have. It, it's uh, uh, <clears throat> not extremely detailed, but it's not superficial at all either. So here's what he says, the source of real power. The Protestant Reformation of the 16th century was a major recovery of the light of the gospel. Does that sound like I read that before, Verla? Verla doesn't remember either. Neither one of us can remember. So Martin Luther played a huge role in that recovery. But by the end of his life, Luther was very concerned that the gospel would be lost again within one generation and replaced by superstition. Isn't that somebody, I think people have said before that the church is only one generation from extinction. Well, Christ's church is never going to be extinct, but you know, you know what I mean. Uh, I think it's like uh, um, there aren't any grandchildren in, in Christ. That is to say, uh, somebody's not a Christian just because their parents were a Christian. And so anyway, it can be lost. In February of 1546, just a few days before he died, Luther preached his last sermon in his hometown of Eiselben. In that sermon, he said, In times past, we would have run to the ends of the world if we had known of a place where we could have heard God speak. He's talking about the earlier years of the Reformation. You know? We would have run to the ends of the world if we'd known of a place where we could have heard God speak. But now that we hear his this every day in sermons, we don't see this happening. You hear at home, you hear at home in your house, father and mother and children sing and speak it, the gospel. This, the preacher speaks it in the local church. You ought to lift up your hands and rejoice that we've been given the honor of hearing God speak to us through the word. Oh, people say, what is that? After all, there's preaching every day, often many times every day, so that we soon grow weary of it. What do we get out of it? All right, go ahead, dear brother. If you don't want God to speak to you every day at home, in your house, and in your parish church, then be clever. Look for something else, something new. In prayer, and it must be a a place, a town, T-R-A-E-R. In prayer is our Lord God's coat. In Aiken, A-A-C-H-E-N, another town are Joseph's britches. And our blessed lady's chemise. Go there and squander your money. Buy indulgences and the Pope's secondhand junk. Luther. What was referring, Luther referring to when he spoke of our Lord's coat and Joseph's britches and so on? Well, he was talking about the practice in his time of going on lengthy pilgrimages to see the so-called relics of the church. 
One could find a hair from the beard of John the Baptist, a vial of milk from the breast of Mary, pieces of the cross, and many other objects that supposedly came from biblical times. Luther's own benefactor, Frederick the Wise, had nearly 18,000 of these dubious objects. People would go over land and sea to search for the indulgences that would be granted by making a pilgrimage to these relics. Why did this happen? Why did pilgrims flock to various places to view these relics? The answer is simple. The people were suffering from impotency in their spiritual lives, and they believed there was wonder-working power in the relics of the church. They wanted the heavens to open with miracles and showers of divine demonstrative power, and they looked for it in the bones and possessions of the dead. Now, we are far too sophisticated for this now, aren't we? I'm not so sure. Just turn on your television. Watch the televangelists slay people in the spirit, knock them to the floor. Likewise, people travel here and there to engage in hysterical laughter or other odd practices. What are they looking for? They seek the power of God. But the true power, the power that will change your life is the power of of the dunamis, of the spirit of the, of, the Holy, of the God of the Holy Spirit. And God promises to accompany the preaching of his word with that power. Preaching has no power unless God the Holy Spirit takes his word and penetrates hearts with it. That's where the power is if you believe the word of God. Well, those are great words from, from R.C. Sproul. Um, now, I'll just introduce the next few verses in the minutes we have left here. The heading here you see on the, in the ESV, your sorrow will turn into joy. Okay, verse 16. A little while and you will see me no longer. And again a little while and you will see me. Now, and you know behind those words. We're going to see that, that phrase, a little while. Um, you don't see him, then you see him has several applications here, meanings, but certainly the immediate one is going to be he goes to the cross, right? And, uh, and then he rises from the dead. You know, you will see me no longer. He's crucified. Then you will see me a little while. You will see me raised from the dead. So some of his disciples said to one another, what is this that he says to us a little while? You will not see me. And again, a little while and you will see me. And because I'm going to the Father. So they were saying, what does he mean by a little while? We don't know what he's talking about. Jesus knew that they wanted to ask him, so he said to them, is this what you're asking yourselves, what I meant by saying a little while and you will not see me, and again a little while and you will see me? Truly, truly, I say to you, you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will turn into joy. When a woman's giving birth, she has sorrow because her hour has come. But when she's delivered the baby, she no longer remembers the anguish for joy that a human being has been born into the world. So also, you have sorrow now, but I will see you again and your hearts will rejoice and no one will take your joy from you. In that day you will ask nothing of me. Truly, truly, I say to you, whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Until now you've asked nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive that your joy may be full. All right, well, there's quite a bit in those verses and some of the themes keep coming up again. In fact, the one theme, um, uh, uh, he ends the chapter with one. Jesus didn't end a chapter. He would just spoke. But the last verse in this chapter, I've said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I've overcome the world. Now, among some of the other themes in these verses is this business of Christ's people having sorrow and tribulation now. But that that sorrow and tribulation will be turned to joy ultimately that that day is coming and Jesus really 
emphasizes that theme and it's vital that we understand it and get it down. You know, there's plenty of plenty of preachers and people around us that are, are saying that, that uh, they're, you know, well, you know, think of the, the joy that we have as, as Christians and we should never be sorrowful and uh, uh, we should just be happy. Come on, put a smile on your face, that, that kind of a thing. Well, you're not going to find that in the scripture. Christ does give us a peace. He gives us joy. But it's not come in its fullness yet. We are in this world and the experience of Christ's people in this world is the same experience that Christ himself had in this world. And uh, um, Christ is a source of joy for us. But in this world, we will have sorrow and, tr and tribulation. And uh, if we're going to be wise in following Christ, we need to know that. Well, we'll plan on following up on that in more detail then next time. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for your truth. Thank you for the spirit of truth. And we pray that you would make us wise, that we would be able to discern your, your spirit and your word from the, uh, the counterfeit, from the, the enemy. We pray that you would increase our faith and even though we live in this fallen troubled and painful world that we know that one day our sorrow will be turned to fullness of joy and we pray that that day comes soon and we pray this all in christ's name amen